Hi, I'm Dave Watts. Welcome to the sixth part of GSA 200, Improving Relevancy. In this session, we'll learn how we can identify potential search problems using reports and improve search results using synonyms, biasing, entity recognition, and wildcards. We'll also learn about metadata sorting. Before you can improve search, you have to understand what needs to be improved. To find this out, you have to learn what people are searching for and whether they're finding it. Search reports and raw search logs let us understand search quality and user behavior. What are people looking for? Are they finding anything? Are they finding what they're looking for? Basic search reports like the one shown here can tell us when people are searching and what keywords and queries they're using. And we have access to more detailed search information through logs and advanced search reports. The first place we might look for those answers is search reports. These are generated from the raw logs that record every search. Search reports can be generated at any time. They can specify a date range of up to one year. Search reports will correspond to a single collection, so you may need to run separate reports for different collections. They can contain searches that return results or searches that did not return results, but not both, so you might have to generate two reports for whatever time period you want to view. You can also exclude specific keywords that you might be using for automated diagnostic searches, and you can specify the number of keywords and search queries you want to see. The report itself will show the number of searches per day, the average number of searches per hour, and the top keywords and queries as shown on the previous slide. For more information, we can consult the raw search logs. Because the GSA is a web server, it logs HTTP requests just like any other web server. Each request contains the entire URL, and each search URL contains all of the parameters used to control the search. As a result, you can mine search logs for any aspect of search. What front ends are people using, what collection they're using, and so on. However, to process the log files, you need a tool designed to parse web server log files and extract data, such as web trends. Google does not provide a web log analysis tool for you to use. Log files are kept by the GSA for one year. After a year, log file data is deleted. So, you should consider exporting log files on a scheduled basis so you don't lose valuable data. You can export log files manually or use the admin API. You can also configure the GSA to use a syslog server to which the GSA will send search and admin logs. One limitation with search reports and search logs is that they only show us the search itself. But what happens after a user runs a search? If the search returned no records, we can assume that it's a failed search and identify that using search reports or logs. But some searches may return results but still be unsuccessful from the user's perspective. Advanced search reports lets us see what happens after a search. Does the user click on one of the search results? Does the user click to view the next page? Or run a completely new search? Advanced search reports uses click tracking to track the user's actions after the search. By default, the GSA collects advanced search report data. There is a checkbox to enable this within the page layout helper for each front end. You may want to disable it unless you plan to view the reports, as there is additional overhead in capturing click tracking data. Advanced search reports rely on JavaScript to send click tracking data back to the GSA. Advanced search report data can be viewed within regular search reports or extracted as web server logs. Only very basic information can be viewed as part of a search report. Which rank and page was a selected result? Additional information showing the user's exact steps is available within the web server's advanced search report logs. Even if you don't plan to view advanced search report data regularly, there is one reason why you might still want to enable it. The click tracking data is used by another feature on the GSA called the self-learning score. This can affect the relevance of documents. The ones that are most often selected after a search will, over time, become more relevant. Let's take a look at search reports and search logs on the GSA. So I've logged into my GSA and I'll jump right to reports. We've already seen serving logs 
I'll jump right to search reports. And here I get an interface that will let me create search reports for a specific collection. So if a user is searching against that collection specifically, they'll show up in this search report. I can choose searches that did or did not return results. I'm going to go ahead and choose searches that did return results. And I'll give my report a name and specify a date range. I can also specify the number of top queries and keywords to show. By default, that's 100. And I might choose to exclude diagnostic terms. If I have a page that I'm using to poll the GSA periodically and make sure that everything's working, I'm typically going to use a unique search with that so I could exclude that here. I won't bother that. We'll see our unique search in our search results. So I'll click on Generate Report and wait for that to finish processing. So it'll take me up here to a screen that says Generating. Once the search reports have been generated, I can go ahead and view or export that report. If I click the view link, it'll show me searches per day, and I chose several months to view, so I can see over March, April, May. This GSA gets used for training, so it doesn't get a whole lot of searches on it. I can see searches per hour, top 100 keywords, and top 100 queries. Now, this second example under queries uh, is a good example of something that I would probably exclude. We have a page that says thank you that we're using to poll whether the GSA is responding properly. So we'll see a couple of queries with the words thank you in them. And of course, the one at the top is run quite a bit because it's used by an automated process. Below the keywords and queries, I can see my advanced search reporting data. So advanced search reporting data shows me the rank and page of selected results. However, it's very limited. It doesn't show me uh, what page a given result was on based on its rank or vice versa. In this case, all the results are on the first page. But if I had results on other pages, it wouldn't be clear to me whether a user clicked the first result on the first page or the first result on the second page. So again, just a very simple snapshot of data. Finally, I can see the URLs that came up in searches the IP addresses used to make the searches. Now this can be exported. There's an export button here. If I don't want to view it on the GSA at all, I can export it directly back at the list of reports. If I click on the link, that's going to give me an XML file, which I can then open in a text editor and see the data in an XML format. I could then write a program to consume this data and do whatever I want to do with the data. So search reports are very straightforward. Search logs, again, are the raw data from which search reports are made. So I'll simply choose to do search logs for a shorter period of time. Click on Generate Log, and that'll take a little while to generate. Once it's finished generating, I can view it, export the logs themselves, export only the ASR logs, and if it's over a time period, I can update it to capture new data. So for example, I'm recording this during the month of May 2014. It is not yet May 31st. 
So later on this month, I could click on update to get the latest data. If I click on view, I can see what the raw logs look like. So it'll show me the IP address of the client. It'll show me the URL requested by the client. Now, the key thing here, every piece of data that makes up the search is embedded in this URL. Everything that makes this search unique is embedded in the URL. We can see the front end, client and proxy style sheet. We can see the sort order. We can see the IP address of the client. We can see the collection searched against. We can see what language is supported by the browser if it provides that. Everything about the search is embedded in this URL. But it's embedded as this big string, so you would need to programmatically examine this using a tool that can parse these strings. We can also see the status, and we can see how many results were returned by the search, how long the search took in milliseconds. So a few additional pieces of information. If I click on the export ASR link, that'll download my log file, which I can then open in a text editor. And we can see these aren't like normal web server logs. They actually show a process in reverse chronological order. So for example, recently I ran some searches starting from line 10. First I searched for the word mango. And then I didn't do anything with the search results. Instead I ran another search for the word penguin. And then I clicked on the very first search result on the very first page and that took me to this document. Then I hit the back button in my browser to come back to the page loading it up again and then I clicked on the fourth result within that page which took me to this PDF. I hit the back button again. This time I went and did an advanced search for the word penguin. So I clicked on the advanced search link to bring up that form. That loads another search page. And I went into advanced search again, did a slightly different search, and that loaded that search page. So again, we can see the user's path in reverse chronological order. You'll notice that the IP address is there, and the first value is actually a timestamp. As we mentioned earlier, advanced search reporting is enabled by default. That's configured under each front end. If I drill down to my default front end, and look in the page layout helper under global attributes there's a checkbox to enable ASR if I uncheck that click through data would no longer be collected by the GSA now let's look at some easy to configure features that help users get more relevant results query expansion expands the user's search from the search keywords entered to include additional keywords. There are two types of expansion. Contextual expansion can be applied by the GSA based on the possible context of the words in the query. It applies context to each word to determine the possible candidates for keywords to expand the search. For example, in the search query latest apple, the word apple could mean the fruit or apple computer products. The word latest might indicate that the user is probably interested in the products rather than the fruit. Contextual expansion can be turned on and off, but cannot be controlled beyond that. You can enable contextual expansion for single word queries, but it will be difficult for the GSA to establish context. Non-contextual expansion uses synonym files that you can upload and manage. 
The GSA comes with a set of language-specific files. Depending on where you purchase your GSA, some will be enabled and others disabled. But you can enable and disable whichever files you want. The preloaded synonym files cannot be edited. They can only be enabled, disabled, or downloaded. Within your own synonym files, you can write a set of equivalent entries using curly braces and commas. For example, if the user searches for the word eating, the GSA will also find documents with the word eat, eats, and ate. You can also write unidirectional entries using the greater than sign. For example, if the user searches for DVD, the GSA will also find documents with the words video disc, but if the user searches for video disc, the GSA will not find documents with DVD. Good candidates for synonym files often include products or services your company provides, or industry terminology and acronyms as well as department names or abbreviations. You may want to solicit input from other people in your organization to build these lists. You can create your own synonym files, and you can also create blacklist and stop words files. Blacklist files contain words not to be expanded, even if there's a match within an enabled synonym file. Stop words files contain words not to be used in queries. Files can be used with individual languages or with all languages. Query expansion can apply to the text within a document, to its title, and to its metadata. When creating these files, make sure you use a text editor that can explicitly save text files with UTF-8 encoding. Otherwise, you may lose diacritics and other characters. Also, you may not use more than 32 entries within a single set of equivalent entries. A single expansion file may not exceed 3 megabytes. And finally, you may not have more than 300 expansion files enabled. Both contextual and non-contextual expansion can be applied to any query. You have control over non-contextual expansion but you don't really know what will happen with contextual expansion if it's enabled. As a result, you may want to test this with common queries to see whether it helps or hurts overall relevance. There are two ways to enable query expansion. Within the Filters tab of your front end, you can specify one of four options for query expansion for documents and titles and for metadata specifically. The four options are no expansion, Standard, Local, and Full. Standard is contextual expansion. Local is non-contextual. Full includes both standard and local. These values can also be set using the ENTQR URL parameter for documents and titles and ENTQRM for meta tags specifically. URL parameters take precedence over the filter settings. Expansion at work. Before I apply query expansion, I'm going to run a couple of sample searches. If I search for CBS, I get one document back. But if I actually search for the network name, I get no results. If I search for the word program or programming, either one, I'll get some results. And if I search for the phrase computer science, I will get different results. So with that in mind, I've created an expansion file. The first rule in the expansion file contains a comma delimited list of items within curly braces and each of these will be treated as a synonym for all the others. So if I search for Columbia Broadcasting System that will search for CBS, iNetwork, and Tiffany Network. These are old names for the CBS Network. If I search for iNetwork, it'll search for Columbia Broadcasting System, CBS, and Tiffany Network, and so on. 
So these are multi-directional. The second line, if I search for the word program, it'll find documents that have computer science, but not the opposite. If I search for computer science, it will not find documents that contain the word program unless they also contain the words computer science as well. So I prepared this text file and I made sure to save it with UTF-8 encoding. And now I'm ready to upload that to the GSA. So I'll navigate to search and then query settings. And as you can see, there are many language-specific files already on the appliance. But only one is enabled, and that is English Stems. It's enabled for standard terms, but not for meta tag names or meta tag values. Now, I'll scroll down and choose the file that I want to use, Expansion Demo. I can specify what type of file it should be. We've already seen it's a synonyms file. Blacklist files contain simply a list of words. Each word is on a separate line and it will not be expanded. The same for stop words. I will upload my file. And then click on apply settings. Once the settings are applied, uh, while I'm here, I'll go ahead and point out the ability to enable contextual synonym expansion for one-word queries. By default, it only applies to queries with more than one word. Okay, once I've applied that, uh, I will have to wait a while uh, for it to take effect in some cases. But let me go ahead and run some searches. So again, if I run a search for CBS, I should get one document. If I run a search for Columbia Broadcasting System before I got no documents, now I get the same document. Likewise, if I search for I network, if I search for program, I get program results. But if I scroll down, I can see I also get computer science results. I can see that this match the search for computer science and not for program because the words are bolded in the snippet. However, if I search for computer science, I will not find the documents that contain the word program. So that's non-contextual expansion at work. But we also have contextual expansion. So let's take a look at some examples here. So contextual expansion is enabled on my front end. And if I do a search for the words guitar instruction, you'll notice that it automatically searches for guitar lesson as well. That's not programmed in using my lists. That's just a feature of the GSA if contextual expansion is enabled. If I simply search for the word instruction, you'll notice that documents with the word lessons or lesson are not found. So again, we can see that by default, two words are needed for contextual expansion to take effect. If I went back to my query settings, 
I could choose to enable contextual synonym expansion for one word queries and the GSA may then find documents with the word lesson when I search for documents with the word instruction. By default, the GSA does a very good job of identifying relevance, but in some cases, you may have specific needs to make some documents more or less relevant than others. Biasing allows us to do that using URL patterns, dates, or metadata and entities. Biasing can make new documents even more relevant than old ones, or can favor some file types over others. To use biasing, you can create a biasing policy or edit the existing default policy. A single policy can be applied to multiple front ends, but a single front end can only have one policy applied. Biasing should not be applied without testing. You may find that you don't need it at all. Again, the GSA is very good at identifying relevance all by itself. But if you think you need biasing, test searches with and without biasing to see whether relevance improves. Let's take a look at biasing at work. Before I apply biasing, I'm going to run a search for the word penguin and click on the button to clear the filter. And when I run that search, I see I get back four documents in all. And the very first one is a Word document. And the very last one is a PDF. Now, let's say that you have a requirement that PDFs should, all other things being equal, be more relevant than Word documents. We can do this through a biasing policy. I'll go back to my appliance go to search and then result biasing and I'll create a new policy I'll call it doc policy and then I'll edit this policy now there are three types of biasing as we mentioned before source date and metadata and all three of them start with a question how much influence should that type of biasing have? So we have from a range from no influence to more influence. And then we have 11 radio buttons. I'll go ahead and choose more influence to maximize the value of source biasing here, to maximize the effect of source biasing here. And then I'll specify some URL patterns. I have the ability to use URL patterns collections or specific feed data sources. So I'll look for URLs that end in .doc and I will make those less relevant and then documents that end in PDF I will make more relevant. So those will be my two values. Now while I'm here I'll scroll down and look at the other types of biasing even though I'm not going to use them. Date biasing simply has the 11 radio buttons from no influence to more influence and a checkbox to specify what we consider old. Now even without date biasing generally documents that are newer are going to be considered more relevant than documents that are older in many cases. This simply exaggerates that effect. Finally, we have metadata and entity biasing, which basically lets us specify the documents with a specific metadata field or value or both are more or less relevant. Finally, there's a checkbox that says skip after first match. And basically, the first rule that applies to a document is going to be used and subsequent rules will be skipped. You can choose to disable this but honestly you can get very confusing situations if you have multiple rules that apply to the same document. So you want to be careful and keep your rule set as simple as possible. I'll go ahead and click on Save. Now once that biasing policy has been created I'll need to apply it to a front end. I generally want to create a new front end for this rather than apply it to my existing front end, at least initially. 
And the reason for this is that it's very useful to be able to run searches side by side. So I'll go to my new biasing front end and then go to the filters tab and scroll down to my result biasing policy and I'll set it to the new doc policy. Then click on save. Now I'll open up a new search tab. I do want to keep these around so this is with the default policy which is by default assigned to the default front end. I'll change my client and front end to biasing policy or biasing front end. Reload my search form and this time search again for penguin. And I can see right off the bat that my first result is a PDF instead of a Word document. If I remove the filter, the PDF is now the first result and the Word document is the last result. So again, in the original search, the Word document was first and the PDF was last. And now we've reversed that with our biasing policy. Biasing and many other features on the GSA can take advantage of metadata if you have it. But what if you don't? Entity recognition can be used to create entities based on document content using simple string matches, regular expressions, and the creation of composite entities from a sequence of simple entities. These entities aren't metadata, but can be used by the GSA as if they were. To extract these entities, you'll need to be able to define rule sets for matching content within your documents. To use entity recognition, it must first be enabled. Once enabled, simple entities can be added by uploading files containing matching rules to the GSA. These matching rules can contain a list of strings. For example, the GSA comes with a simple entity file containing a list of countries. If your documents contain a matching country, the GSA will create a country entity with a corresponding value. Matching rules can also contain regular expressions within an XML file. The GSA comes with an example of this for parsing dates from documents. Simple entities can be marked as transient if you only want to use them to create composite entities. Composite entities can be defined from a collection of simple entities. An example of this is on the GSA as well for creating a location out of a city name followed by a country name. You can download and view all of the example entity files. Individual simple entities all have their own files, while a single file contains all of the composite entities in use. Composite entities use LL1 grammar to identify a sequence of simple entities. There are also many individual settings that can be applied to entity recognition, such as how many entities a single document can have, how large can they be, and so on. Also, entity recognition can be easily tested by pointing the GSA to a specific document from within the Entity Diagnostics tab. This applies all of your entity rules to the document. It lists the entities found with their counts and you can expand each entity found. Let's see how entity recognition works. Go to Index, Entity Recognition, and you'll notice I have a series of tabs simple entities, composite entities, blacklist, entity diagnostics and adjustments. By default, entity recognition is disabled when you get a new appliance, but I've already enabled it here. So I can see that it's enabled and there are three simple entities defined. Just for fun, I'll take a look at one of these. And I can see that it's just a lot of lines of text. Each line contains a different city name. If I take a look at the dates.xml file, this contains 
some regular expression patterns to match common date formats. Now I've created my own file with a list of different types of fruit. I'm going to upload that to the GSA. And I'll name my entity fruit. I can specify whether it's case sensitive and I can specify whether it's transient. I can also specify whether it looks at the URL, the content of the document, or both. I'll go ahead and use both. Once I've made my selections, I'll click on Upload. Now once it's uploaded, while I'm here, I'll go ahead and take a look at my Entity Diagnostics tab. So the Entity Diagnostics tab will let me put in a URL or upload a file and test it. For my entities. So I have a list of files that contain various fruit names and what I'll do is simply copy the link for one of those and paste it in my test box and then click on go and I can see that the entity fruit is recognized and the value that matches it is banana. Now you'll notice that there are multiple matches here. If this document had other words for fruit, for example, if I had added plantain to my list of entities, then that would have matched as well. So now that I've applied my list of entities, I'll go ahead and uh, re-index the content that is associated with this directory. So I'll go back to Index Diagnostics and I will drill down to my Ranges directory and then click on the button to recrawl this pattern. After a short time, after recrawling the content, I can visit one of the pages and scroll down and you'll notice that I have an entity here, GSA entity underscore fruit, that was added by my entity list. So all of the entities provided by this mechanism will have this prefix in their metadata. Now when I created my entity list, I chose to leave it case insensitive. So if I take a look at some of these, like Mango, you'll notice that Mango shows up three times in different case. If that's something that I'm concerned about or want to prevent, I would need to make sure that I turned off case sensitivity when I set up my entity list. You'll notice also that each link here in Index Diagnostics gives me a link to Entity Diagnostics, which simply loads that file and shows me all of the entities found in the document. Now this does not necessarily represent what's in the index because I can test the file with my list of entities before I recrawl it. But once the document is re-indexed, this is what I would see. So you'll notice I have country, several entries for country, several entries for fruit. GSA 7.2 supports wildcard searches using asterisks as placeholders for zero or more characters and using question marks as placeholders for a single character. To use wildcard searches, you must enable the feature and re-index content. There is an additional performance cost for indexing with this feature enabled. Wildcard searches can be used with document text and with metadata, but they cannot span word boundaries. 
Finally, documents written in double-byte character languages, such as Chinese, Japanese, Korean, and Taiwanese, cannot be found through wildcard searches. To enable wildcard indexing, go to Index Settings, then Re-Index All Content. Under each front end, you can use the Filters tab to control how many expansions can be created from a single wildcard and whether the asterisk is treated as a wildcard placeholder or a literal character. Like most other settings in the Filters tab, these can also be controlled by URL parameters, WC and WC underscore MC. Here are some examples of valid and invalid wildcard searches. Valid searches must honor word boundaries and must contain at least one three-character literal string. End of words contain an implied terminator character, so you can use a two-character literal with an end of string. Remember that hyphens are treated as spaces and therefore are considered word boundaries. To use wildcards effectively, search users will need to understand these limitations, so you should provide some information to them. This can be done directly within your search interface or separately through training. Let's try some wildcard searches. The first I'll search for the word health, but I will only search for the first two characters of the word health. So H-E and then an asterisk. Now you might remember I mentioned earlier that you need three letters in your pattern but the word boundary itself is treated as a letter. So if I run that search, I find anything that begins with H-E, health, healthy, Helga, and this, heroes. You'll notice that all of these match the beginning of the word. You'll also notice that when I ran the query, this was added to the beginning of it automatically. So the GSA saw the asterisk, knew that was a wildcard character, and automatically applied that as a wildcard search. Next, I'll search for asterisk EAL, and that finds anything with the letters EAL within the word health, healthy, meals, seal, dealership, real. Now if I just put in two letters, star, ea, star, there's no possibility for a word boundary there. So that brings back no documents. Remember we have two placeholders. We have the question mark and the asterisk. So the asterisk represents more than one character and the question mark re represents exactly one character. If I run a search with fr question mark i asterisk, that'll find anything like fruit, Freischaffender, Fryen, Freiburg, only one letter between the R and the I. So we've already seen what happens when we search for the beginning of a word. So if I search for LYC, that should find Leachy. But if I put in LYC asterisk TREE, -E, even though that's directly after the word, that's going to cross the word boundary. So if I search for that, I get no results back. Until GSA 7.2, you could only sort by relevance or date. Now you can also sort by a single metadata field. To do this, use the meta keyword within your sort parameter instead of date, then specify the name of the field. Other arguments are optional. The GSA will use the top thousand most relevant results and sort them using your metadata field. Documents with no matching metadata field will appear at the bottom of the sorted list. 
Here are some examples of metadata sorting. In the first two, sorting on the writer field, the last specified argument controls case, uppercase or lowercase. Optional arguments can be left empty or omitted entirely depending on whether later arguments are specified. The optional arguments before case are left empty and the last optional argument has been omitted entirely. In the last three examples, sorting on price, the last argument is used to specify whether numeric values will be treated as alphanumeric strings, floating point numbers with region specific punctuation, or as floating point numbers with decimal points but no commas using English region specific punctuation. Let's see metadata sorting at work. So here I've customized a front end to show metadata fields if they're present and I've specified a search query that will retrieve records based on their metadata and finally within the URL I've also specified that I want to fetch one metadata field writer. So by default these are sorted by relevance and we can see that there is a sort parameter with the first value of date and then a bunch of colons and other values. Well, collectively that means sort by relevance, even though it has the word date. So I'm going to replace that sort argument uh, in just one second. Let me scroll through my results. I can see that I have Shakespeare followed by Shaw, but then I have Coward and then Coward again at the bottom. So we can see these are clearly not sorted by writer. So again I'm going to return to my sort parameter and simply replace it with meta colon writer. Rerun the search and now I can see that Coward is listed first followed by Shakespeare and then followed by Shaw. This concludes our sixth presentation, Improving Relevancy. Thank you for watching, and make sure to watch the other GSA 200 presentations.